Internet, you are now listening to the Free Lunch Podcast. This is your man, Premium Pete. Yeah, I'm calling from Brooklyn, and I'm letting you know that you're tuned right in. Don't go nowhere. The place to be is right here. Listen to the Free Lunch Podcast. Cheers. Yeah. Ah. Then it set the world on fire, take the block by storm, but I blow so cold. Nigga, warm your hands in the hill where the fire burn blue when the wheels turn slow when the seal. Feel your skin, but it ain't so soft. I was raised in the veil, I prepared for a war, and my shield so thorough that I don't need a hammer, and the heat don't scare me, man. This Alabama in the summer, like a hammer to a runner, you gon' feel me. Go ahead, call me Green Tea Billy. Free Willy in your mind at the same damn time. Listen, man, I'm the truth, won't lie. That's why I tell you, put your hand to the sky. We can live for the moment, screaming out omens like the roof on fire. Welcome to the Free Lunch Podcast. We are a member of the New South Movement Podcast Network. My name is Tight BGZ. How you feeling? I'm feeling great. Free Lunch Podcast, BG27 Kid. We are back in the building doing what we do. Bringing the soul food for your mind. How you feel, man? A lot going on in your world these days. <laughs> it is, it is, and we gonna we gonna we gonna keep uh, podcasts and real life separate. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the, the podcast is supposed to be like a free fall. This is where we come and release and and let things out. You don't feel like doing that. I'm anti social media, so okay, with me being anti social media, I'm gonna treat. I'm gonna treat that part of my life separate than 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 uh, what's been happening uh, with the podcast. But with that being said, that. no, absolutely. How was your day though? And everything is is good, man. Like you know, it's always it's good to to be able to decompress. We always call this like a decompress moment. Right now, we're still working nine to fives. We go and we do that grind, and then we come and do what we love. We get into our passion project. So you know, having this opportunity has been a minute since we've been able to, to jump on the microphones but now that we back i feel like i'm at home i'm able to relax again so i ain't got not one complaint it's a passion project but bg we about to touch on embark in a in a in a, in a lane that that we haven't that we haven't embarked on yet i mean we've had mm-hmm. we've had a lot of personalities on the show yeah. but we've about to we've about to embark in, a, in an area that i've been a lifelong fan of and and i really think it's an untapped market and and i like to see how uh, this this particular arena is really coinciding clashing with hip-hop in a lot of ways we're talking about a little wrestling today we're gonna talk a little wrestling <laughs> did I mean, you go and watch a wrestler did you go and watch a wrestler you. Oh, oh man coming where i come from being in the south I mean, there were not any Saturdays or Mondays, Thursdays that I wasn't tuned in watching wrestling of some sort, man. And it's funny. Like, I even had my little sister watching wrestling. I, and we were just talking about it the other day about how we would just sit around and from time to time we would imitate some of the stuff that we were watching on the <laughs> television screen. And, of course, mom and dad weren't too happy about that. But it, it was just one of those things. It was something that was just embedded in the in the fabric of what we did, what we grew up in. It's a part of the culture. Um, and, you know, when we started preparing for this and you told me who we had on, started doing the research, it started bringing back so many memories, man. And I feel like that's kind of the reason that we're seeing this, this, um, this energy that's building around it is because here we are now 30 and there's so much a part of our lives and our childhood now we sit back and we're reflecting on those things, remembering those good moments. So I got excited, man, just listening to some of the some of the podcasts that I guess has has put out. It just really just did something to me. So I'm I'm ready, man. I'm ready for this one. Today's guest is actually, in my opinion, a podcast game changer because the format that he uses for uh for for his shows, in my opinion, really reflect what I would think is, is going to be a new wave that we see just in the podcast business. And um, he's a lifelong wrestling fan, 15 year veteran of mortgage business. So I'm, I'm kind of in- interested to see how he, or allow him to tell his story as to how he went from, and he still does um, 
mortgage business from my from from my understanding but but being able to also do something that we're doing that's podcast um but he has he's the um co-host of two of the most popular podcasts uh surrounding wrestling uh something to wrestle with with bruce pritchard and what happened when uh you can listen to those podcasts on all your podcast platforms my favorite is something to wrestle with. I actually stumbled up uh, with Bruce Pritchard. I actually stumbled upon that podcast um, from from Richard Deitch, um, one of the sports um, illustrated who retweeted uh, back early in the game. He retweeted um, uh, this podcast and, and 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 from that very moment, I fell in love with it. So it was only right. And, and with me seeing how wrestling has really played a part in our culture, um, I really wanted to get this guy on today. And last thing is that he's from the state of Alabama. With me being from Mobile, you being from Selma, Alabama, it was only right that we had to bless the bless the podcast with North someone who's doing oh, absolutely extraordinary things. Um, so with that being said, I would like to introduce the Free Lunch Podcast family to the co-host of two of the most popular wrestling podcasts out there alabama native conrad thompson how you doing today sir i'm good man i appreciate that introduction i hope i live up to the hype yes sir oh absolutely absolutely so first question is is when did wrestling become something that that you fell in love with uh it first caught my eye in 1988 Uh, i was introduced to a double vhs tape of wrestlemania 4 and uh, I was hooked right away. I was all about the Macho Man and Hulk Hogan, and uh, it was a big day for me. And I, I was a pretty hardcore fan. I was seven at the time, and um, I was a big fan until I guess I was 12. And then I just kind of said, eh, I think I'm going to put this up for a while. But then I circled back uh, when I was 15 or 16 and paid really close attention uh, up until I guess it was 96 and then I kind of fell out around 04, 05. Uh, but I came back around in 2013 and, uh, now I have as much to do with wrestling as I ever did before. So BG, I find it interesting cause I was actually introduced to wrestling with the Von Eriks. <laughs> and so my brother, who's actually an older brother, uh, we would come home from, we would come home from elementary school and and he that's the first thing he would watch if you all remember um kevin von eric and the von eric's being on uh world championship wrestling and um i hated it absolutely hated wrestling but it was right around wrestlemania 3 wrestlemania 4 that same timeline uh comrade that that i kind of started to to really en- enjoy the sport what was it about wrestling that you really enjoyed about watching it well, as a kid, it was, uh, I mean, it was like a cartoon superhero, except real life. And so, you know, I had grown up before that watching He-Man and G.I. Joe and all the stuff that kids our age watched. And this is like the real life live action version of it. And at the time, you just assume that everything's real. And of course, later when you're smartened up, you realize it's not real, but neither were the cartoons or the movies I enjoyed. So it didn't take away from my enjoyment even once I was smartened up that maybe it's not as legitimate as I thought it was. But it was still genius. The storylines, it, it just brought you back week in after week out. I, I mean, I was watching everything from WCW, WWF, and I would even come home sometimes in the afternoon and watch like ECW. No, I agree. It is a male soap opera for sure. And uh, I watched all those promotions. And I think, you know, if you're a wrestling fan, you can find something good about most of them. Uh, just like, you know, there may be some movies we like more than others, but most of us could get through any movie if we really tried. And so I feel like sometimes uh, that's what our Monday nights are like when maybe it's not the best show ever, but we're just going to try. So you're from Alabama. I actually grew up down by Montgomery in a city called Prattville. And uh, I moved Absolutely. out of Prattville, I guess, when I was 12. Mm-hmm. And I finished mm-hmm. uh, high school in Gunnersville. And then once I started working, our nearest biggest city uh, the place with the most opportunity, at least in my mind, was Huntsville. So I got a job up here and uh, started working. And a year or so in, found the mortgage business, and the rest is history, as they say. But, no, I did play football as a kid. When I was really little, I played baseball. But I did play football. I was a lineman and enjoyed that. And then I 
uh, found wrestling online in, I guess, 1996, late 96, very early 97. And I, and that's when the internet was first starting to become a thing. And I was fascinated with all the different things you could do online. And so that kind of captivated my imagination for a little bit. And then eventually, of course, when I go to college, I started working a real job and uh, started focusing on making money and all the hobbies kind of went by the wayside for a while. What was your first job out of college? I, uh, my first job out of college was in mortgages. I actually, um, pursued, I was in sales prior to this and I sold direct, I sold door to door, uh, not really door to door, but in home. And so it was vacuum cleaner sales that actually led to me being in mortgages. And I was next door to a mortgage company and the guy recruited me. I was 19 at the time. and just kind of explained how it worked and I had never gotten a mortgage. I'm 19 years old, but I sat with him one afternoon. He kind of broke it all down and explained it. I saw the opportunity, spent a day with him, uh, just kind of trying it and fell in love with it and thought it was awesome. Yeah. I would be able to help people buy a house or help people lower their monthly payments or send their kids to college or all the stuff that you got to do. Uh, that was really motivating to me. When did you first get into the podcast industry? So I started uh, doing mortgages August 27th, 2001. I decided to uh, kind of go out on my own in 2006, and I started uh, recruiting heavily in 2008. And then I decided, hey, I need to get these people who have come over some leads, so I need to start advertising. So I started advertising pretty heavily in 2009 uh, mm-hmm. on radio and television. And I got comfortable doing stuff on the radio. And one of the things we would do are live spots. So I would call in on morning drive and talk to the morning show host live and talk about mortgages. And I got comfortable with that and got fairly decent at it. Uh, Fast forward, I was on vacation in 2012 for New Year's. I was out in Vegas to see a UFC with some buddies. I'm killing time and pull up eBay and I see a Ric Flair robe, a real one. And I think this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. So I negotiate with the guy <laughs> buy one. and then once I've got one, it's like, okay, now that I have it, what the hell am I going to do with it? I've got to have a place to display this. And I don't know what you do with this. So I started to think about how I could display it. And I decided I wanted a replica belt. So I ordered a belt from Dave Milliken. All my research online said that he was the premier go-to guy. If you wanted one of those big gold belts, like Ric Flair used to wear with his robes. Mm-hmm. So I placed an order from him, and he is really good friends with Mark James, who had written a lot of books about wrestling. And at that time, he was writing a book with Jim Cornette. Jim Cornette introduced me to um, J.J. Dillon. He used to be the manager of the Four Horsemen, who eventually mm-hmm. introduced mm-hmm. me to Ric Flair, who eventually introduced me to Bruce Pritchard. And along the way, uh, I became really good friends with Rick. Uh, he had an opportunity to do a podcast and was kind of uncomfortable with the idea of it just being him and a microphone. And he really wanted somebody to kind of bounce stuff off of. So he asked, since he knew I was somewhat familiar with radio, would I come just sit in with him one day for a podcast and just ask fan questions, uh, just to get him comfortable and familiar. And we would just call it a practice show. Well, he liked it. CBS liked it. They asked me to come back. I did every episode of Woo Nation and then the Ric Flair show. And somewhere along the way, I befriended Bruce Pritchard. And as we started to hang out more and more, I realized, hey, wait a minute. This guy has stories nobody's heard before. This is a podcast. It may not be the typical format that everybody wants it in, but they want the information this guy's got. How can I help get this out there? And something to wrestle with Bruce Pritchard was born. Here we are. So you got introduced to a lot of these um, superstar wrestlers from ordering the belt online? Yeah, I ordered the robe, and then I decided I wanted a belt. So when I ordered a belt from Dave, I didn't realize it, but Dave lived right up the road from me in Tennessee. So we hit it off. He was used to placing orders from people in Florida or Virginia or Texas or California or Japan. So the idea that somebody was ordering a belt right up the road, he thought was pretty cool. Uh, Well, he had um, a pretty big little wrestling collection, and I had one that was growing now that I had a Ric Flair robe. So he wanted to see my robe. I wanted to see his belt. So we agreed, just like you and I did, hey, let's let's catch up on the phone. So we did. We hit it off, realized that we liked a lot of the same things, had a lot in common. One thing leads to another. We actually hung out in real life in Georgia, which is kind of a halfway point for us. Mm -hmm. Uh, We hit it. So then we planned a little gathering of, you know, our little wrestling nerd fans. And one of the guys there uh, was a guy who was writing books with Jim Cornette. We hit it off. And then he introduced me to Jim, who introduced me to JJ, who introduced me to Rick. 
and it wasn't a, a business thing. It was, uh, you know, there was no plan to do podcasting. That wasn't even anything I'd ever even considered. What is Jim Cornette like in real life? Uh, he's probably the most interesting man in the world. Uh, he's not nearly the cartoonish character that we make him on the show, but, um, he, he definitely is very opinionated and he knows how to tell a story. Um, but he's very deliberate with his words and I, I can't imagine a scenario where he's ever had an alcoholic drink. He is as sharp as sharp is. Uh, so as far as his wit and, you know, his ability to weave a story together. He's a wordsmith if there ever was one. If Jim Cornette was uh, 20 years younger, Jim Cornette would be Little Dicky. <laughs> BG, you remember Jim Cornette? Yeah, I remember Jim Cornette. One of, one of like, the legendary figures in the whole wrestling game. Let me ask this question, though. I mean, it's not every day that you get an opportunity to meet Ric Flair, let alone be able to work with him, and then, then also kind of develop a friendship. Did you ever have that fan moment? Oh, for sure. I've had, I've had dozens. Uh, it was never, as you said, intentional. It just kind of happened. And I met him at a weird place in his life. I met him the same year his son had just died. And... I'm sure that played a lot into him kind of wanting to hang out with me and feeling comfortable with me. He just, you know, needed a friend and wanted a friend. And that's unfortunate to say, but that's just where he was. And he had just relocated from Charlotte to Atlanta. Uh, his son had died in Charlotte. His girlfriend lived in Atlanta. She had to stay there because she had joint custody with her ex-husband. So he kind of had to be in Atlanta. He didn't have a lot of friends in Atlanta and I'm not that far from Atlanta. So when you're a wrestling fan like me and Ric Flair asks, if you want to come over and hang out this weekend, then you say yes. And you go and you wind <laughs> up drinking too much and having a good time and making some fun stories. And you know, he watches the same type of sports I do and has the same type of conversations I do. And we hit it off and, uh, it was all just right place, right time. Happy accident. And did you hit him with a woo when you met him? Uh, I didn't do that when I met him, but I have done that before. And he certainly uh, has done all the, the Ric Flair things that you would imagine. Like, everybody wants to know, has Ric Flair ever chopped you? Yes. We have been drunk enough together that that seemed like an okay idea. And he did. And uh, I can scratch that off my bucket list. So, 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 BG, I mentioned that it, there's been a clash between wrestling and, and hip-hop. And, and, and Rip Flair was the first person that came to mind because I, I remember him going to the Atlanta Falcons and, you know, repeating his famous lines and everyone loves Rick, Rick Flair. W what is he like in real life? Do you get Rick Flair, the guy that we see on TV, or have you seen a different person since when you, when you're around him? The Ric Flair on TV is the Ric Flair in real life. I'm sure once upon a time there was a Richard Morgan Fleer, um, but there's not anymore. R Ric Flair is Ric Flair, and he's Ric Flair 24-7. And he's 68 years old now, I think. That's not going to change anytime soon. He's going to be uh, the nature boy Ric Flair for the rest of his life. So, yeah, I mean, there are more emotional sides of him, but if you've watched a lot of interviews and stuff like that, you've seen Rick can cry at the drop of a hat. So... That guy is the real Ric Flair. Let's just talk about a little bit of the, the podcast that you do. And I just want to say congratulations to you, Conrad, for like having such high performing podcasts. I think you're regularly in the top ten with the with the work that you do. So you do, you know, deserve some applause for that. But you team team up with some other um significant figures in this history of wrestling with let's just start with something to wrestle with with, with Bruce Pritchard, aka Brother Love. How did that come about? And I guess just to kind of give us a breakdown of what this format is that we keep talking about is a little different than what most people do on their shows. Well, most wrestling podcasts are two guys sitting and talking about old stories. And it's normally uh, one famous wrestler talking to another name within the business, whether it's a manager or someone who worked behind the scenes or an in-ring performer. And they just ask basic stuff. So remember that time we did this? Hey, how about that time we did that? What's old so-and-so doing now? How'd you get in the business? Well, what are you up to these days? So it's just kind of more like a where are they now with a little refresher course of what those folks had in common. And there's nothing wrong with that, but wrestling is pretty niche. So when you've got, you know, 50 different pretty prominent wrestling podcasts, and there are exactly that many or more significant wrestling podcasts, 
then you you kind of run out of gas. And so having someone on isn't so special if he was on somebody else's show six months ago and he was on somebody else's show six weeks ago and next week he'll be on somebody else's show. From a fan perspective, it feels like there's not just something on Fox. It's almost like it's the, the presidential address. That's not just on Fox. That's on every station. Well, that's kind of what your guests become. But if you want a if you want a Big Mac, you've got to go to McDonald's. You can't go to Burger King and get that. And so I realized we had to have something that branded ourselves as being different if we were going to attract an audience and stand out. And the other thing I wanted to do was kind of push against the norm and say, we're not going to do any guests, no guests at all, and we're going to go the other way. Instead of very polite surface talk, we're going to get really granular and go really deep. And unlike everybody else who tries to glad hand each other and be nice to strangers, kind of like we're doing right now, we're going to really get on each other's nerves and grind it out and swear and yell and cuss at each other and just be real. And I think some of that comes through the podcast. You can tell that while we may yell and fuss and cuss, at the end of the day, we're best of friends. And I think that comes through because if you've worked with or spent a lot of time with one of your best friends, y'all rub each other the wrong way sometimes too. It's just human nature. And that kind of comes through the show. But the format in particular that's what differ, that's what, so different is we let the fans pick what we talk about. So instead of saying, hey, we're going to talk about something that just happened last night on Raw, no, we're going to talk about something that happened 30 years ago, and we're not even going to pick what we're going to talk about. We're going to put four options on a poll, and we're going to ask you, the fans, what do you want to listen to? And that comes from my sales background. If I'm wanting to sell somebody something, first I need to figure out what do they want to buy. And if I can just give them what they want, why wouldn't I do that? Well, we can do that with the poll, so we do. And the other thing we do different is we don't censor ourselves. If we have a bad word, we just let it fly. And and we don't worry about time. A lot of times podcasters will say it has to be under an hour. It has to be under 45 minutes. The shorter, the better. Our shows are marathons. They'll go two or three hours. But our audience digs it because, unlike everybody else, it's long. It's different. So, we're not censoring ourselves. We're not being nice to each other. We're not worried about time. And we're not talking about current stuff. We're talking about old stuff. And oh, by the way, we don't even dictate what we talk about. The fans do. So everything about it is different. And I think that's why it's been successful. What was the end game for you when you first started? Selling mortgages. <laughs> <laughs> really? I know. Yeah. The, the reality is I, I pay money to advertise a mortgage company on radio and television stations. And I'm paying because they have an audience. Well, why the hell can't I just go build my own audience? And so now we've built an audience that's way bigger than I'd ever pay to be a part of. And on every com- on every uh, episode, you hear a commercial for my mortgage company. And that's not by accident. The goal for me, the real end game, the money in this, is to use this as a vehicle to promote my business. Now, I'm not just doing it to say that I don't care about it. I certainly do. But this is my hobby and now my hobby makes money and my hobby makes money because my hobby supports my living. And that sounds really crazy, but it really is the dream scenario for me that when I get done working, quote unquote, I can then go play with my hobby. But oh, by the way, that hobby supports when I'm working. What was that feeling like when you first realized that that hobby could pay? Uh, the first time the check came, I did a double take. Uh, it was all an idea, and I thought one day it would happen, and it would be a bigger deal. And I was certainly closing mortgages along the way. But then when we got a big advertising check, and I realized, wait a minute, not only am I making money on the mortgages I'm writing out of here, they're actually paying me to do this now. Uh, that was a pretty cool day. I, I had fun spending that money. Was it was it hard for you to convince Bruce to to do the show with you? What was his end game? Yeah, he did not want to do it at all. He had done a podcast a long time ago. He was one of the early adopters to podcasts, and uh, he just had a a sour taste in his mouth. He felt like people were exposing the business. It went against what he believed in. He thought you were supposed to keep things quiet or to yourself. Uh, He was just very opposed. Uh, And then eventually I said, listen, we're not going to impose on your relationships. We're not going to have guests. It's just going to be you talking. And it can be as long or as short as you want, but you get to decide what information is out there because you're the one choosing it. So it's not like he was going to twist your arm and make you talk about something you don't want to. And he was very nervous for the first several episodes. But during the Radicals episode, which I forget how many that in that was, but it was in the first two months, he finally opened up. And when he did, he hasn't turned back. The show has been forever different uh, since the Radicals episode where he stopped worrying about 
the way things sounded and the way things would be positioned and instead just worried about being real and telling the truth. And uh, if I've learned nothing from Howard Stern all these years, it's that if you're just honest and you're true to yourself and you're not putting on a show, you're going to be successful. And that seems to have worked for us. But but you said something that's, that's interesting to me. The industry listens to you. And I've heard even um, you all say that folks over at WWE listen to you all. Does that force Bruce to be more censored when he's when he's talking about different relationships? No, it's actually gone the other way. You know, one thing we had going for us is we knew when we started that Bruce was effectively blackballed from the WWE. So if you know you're never welcome back, you don't really have to worry about stepping on toes. So that's number one. Number two, he completely obliterated TNA on our TNA episode. I mean, it's the yes. worst tongue lashing yeah. I've ever heard anybody give a company. And they thought so much of it that they hired him. So now he's on, as we're taping this right now, he's on pop TV. Uh, and now he's receiving a paycheck from them. And that happened after the podcast. And I think that's the irony of all is people were concerned. And he specifically that this could affect his real life industry, you know, that he used to be a part of, but he was so far removed from wrestling. He kind of didn't care. So because he didn't care, he didn't mind his P's and Q's. He just shot from the hip. Well, people gravitated to it. So now TNA brought him in for one reason. Our podcast has a huge reach. So they feel like if they say, Hey, we have the guy from your favorite podcast, people may tune in. So in a weird way, he's back on TV in the wrestling come in the wrestling business because he crapped on them because it was real and because that realness attracted an audience. What about with you knowing that you're part of the end game now? You're part of now with your podcast being so popular, you have a lot of influence. Well, I don't consider that. I, I really do believe I'm just a wrestling fan. I'm not on there trying to shape the culture or the way people wrestling fan the wrestling fans think about the product. So we don't talk about any current stuff at all. We only talk about old stuff. So that has made me uh, have some pretty cool moments where I'd be at a WWE show and one of the guys who are on the roster now would come over and talk about how awesome the podcast was and how much they enjoyed it. And uh, that type of that type of stuff I could have never imagined as a fan ever meeting these guys, A, much less them coming over to me and say they were a fan of something I did. That's very humbling and very surreal. But I don't lose sight of the fact that I do mortgages. This is just my hobby. I don't have a, a broadcast here. I don't have any special training. I didn't go to school for this. I'm not in the business. I've never taken a bump. I've never fell down or been hit with a chair or speared. So none of that's ever happened to me. So I realize I'm not in this circle. I'm just talking about it and having a good time doing so. How did the connection with um, Tony come about with the uh, What Happened When podcast? The exact same way that Bruce, uh, Bruce and I did. We had Bruce on the Ric Flair show. Well, later we had Tony on the Ric Flair show. So I had his number that way. I saw Tony at the NWA Legends Fan Fest in Charlotte this past year. And to my surprise, man, he is like the Bob Saget of professional wrestling. I had a different impression of him. <laughs> that he was very, um, I don't know, mild and meek-mannered. He is not right. that at all. Right. Uh, and once I saw that, I realized, hey, this is the guy who could be the answer to the WCW version of Bruce's podcast. He was there from 1983 to 2001. He hasn't been overexposed, and he's witty as hell. So if if we've got all this going for us, uh, this should be something that I should be able to sell him, especially since he is a professional broadcaster. Mm -hmm. So I texted him, asked him for his email address. He gave it to me. I sent a, a pretty well-written email, I think, laying out what my plan would be. And he responded with two words, I'm in. Man, the perfect storm. And I and it's just amazing to me the wealth of the well, just the ability of those guys, both of them, to recall all of those moments, as as many moments as there as there were. And of course the research that you have to do, like what type of work do you have to do to even be on par to kind of maybe facilitate or just be aware of what you might talk about based off of what the fans choose? Like, what type of preparation goes into that? Hours and hours. Um, the easiest shows, I'll do three hours. The harder shows, I'll do 12 hours. It's always somewhere in between there. Uh, but like this week, we covered uh, a, a particular pay-per-view from 1996. Well, first of all, I had to go watch the pay-per-view. Well, that took three hours. I took notes during there, and then I started to compile those notes. Then I went online to the wrestlingobserver.com, which is kind of the industry trade magazine. 
And I just kind of copy pasted about a month's worth of issues before and after the show. Uh, and then I just whittled all of that down and then tried to format it. So all of that all told was probably about eight hours invested. Uh, and then we click record and we did about two and a half hours. And then I've got another half hour of editing. So before you know it, I'm at a 12 hour investment on a show that you'll hear and listen to for two and a half hours. You mentioned the Wrestling Observer, which is a site you you reference a lot on the show. What is it with Bruce and Dave that he doesn't like the, the Wrestling Observer? Well, a lot of people who have been in the, the wrestling business for so long were made to believe that the people who wrote about their business but weren't in their business were actually hurting the business. They were exposing the secrets. They were showing you how the magic's done, uh, and that was not a good thing. So he was brought up in a time when talking to David Meltzer was akin to cheating on your wife. You just don't do it. And maybe some people do it, but they shouldn't. And if they are, they should stop. I mean, it really was that cut and dry. Uh, that is not the way it is now. And a lot of the guys who are on the main roster are friendly with Dave and there's nothing wrong with Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But, but there, there was a problem with, with Bruce doing it. And, and along the way, you know, Dave has been very opinionated. Sometimes he would write, not sometimes, most of the time he would write smarmy things that were just there for a reaction, trying to get a reaction, trying to be cute and entertain people. And they are, I enjoy it. But Sometimes that was at the expense of people that were in the business. Sometimes those people were Bruce. Sometimes they were Bruce's friends. Either way, he didn't feel like he had a, he had the right. Bruce didn't feel like Dave had the right to say those things. So he's always had that issue, and that will never change. What would Wrestler Insider say was the the golden years of wrestling? Or have we, or have we had the golden years yet? No, we have for sure. I, I think a lot of that depends on who you ask, really. I mean, on the one hand, I think there's a whole lot of folks who would say that uh, it was the '80s, and you would probably say like '84 to maybe '88. Um, mm-hmm. They would say those mm-hmm. were the absolute biggest years, and other people would say, no, that's not the case. It's probably from like 1998 to 2001. Uh, and there's no arguing that the WWF had one of their best years ever in 2001. WCW had one of their best years ever in 98 and 99. So those years definitely were big banner years as far as box office go. Well, one of my favorite times was the was the NWO. But it, but from listening to the episode that you all did, excuse me, that that wasn't a great year. Was was. Or that wasn't, I, I got the sense that, I don't know if I'm using the right words, but from listening to that podcast, it just felt like the NWO didn't didn't carry over well with the public. Am I Was I missing something or? No, no, you're exactly right. The NWO was over like Rover. They were really, really popular. They made, they set the business on fire in a big way. Um they did they did huge business that there's nothing that anybody can say differently about that however there is an old school way of thinking that says hey um what's the payoff here like do the bad guys just win forever or does somebody eventually beat them and defeat them because mm-hmm. at the end of every movie just the traditional way movies are done you know good overcomes evil and the nwo for maybe far too long was evil winning over and over and over. And there was no real big payoff. And there's lots of reasons as to, or lots of opinions as to why that was. But most of the time it just came down to personality. You know, one guy didn't want to help another guy. And that's unfortunate. Another character that you all talk about that didn't seem to carry over was, was the ultimate warrior. What was it uh, outside of obviously the steroid issue, but he was, he was, I mean, based on others, was he that bad of a wrestler, or what was it about about the Ultimate Warrior? Uh, I think the Ultimate Warrior was really into his character and his look more so than the performance. And there are other wrestlers who were more so into the performance than the look. Mm-hmm. Uh, most wrestlers would agree that Bobby Eaton is one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, and maybe mm-hmm. that Barry Windham are one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. But neither one of those guys would you look at and say, oh, this is Mr. Charisma right here. This guy has this intangible. I would pay money to go see him, whether he was in a boxing ring, an MMA cage, or a movie theater. The Ultimate Warrior had that crazy look that people would attract to. And 
Vince McMahon used to talk to it as if it were a test. Could they walk through an airport unbothered? If they walk through an airport, would people stand back? Would people notice? Would people ask for a picture? Would people want their autograph? Would people be able to spot him and say, I don't know who he is, but he's famous. Mm -hmm. And the Ultimate Warrior Mm -hmm. had that in a big way. So that's what made him so popular. And and I think he realized that it was his look and his body and his physique that did that. So he just focused on that more than anything else. And it's hard to argue that he was wrong for doing so. Did you or have you had a chance to meet Vince McMahon in, in, in real life? I have. I met Vince about two years ago, uh, right before a pay-per-view with Ric Flair. Uh, we got to the building early, and uh, we were hanging out, uh, and we were somewhere between um, the arena and the gorilla position, and we saw Vince with his personal security walking through, and I got to meet him, introduce myself, and shake his hand. And the only thing, I mean, I guess it's probably like it feels when you shake Walt Disney's hand. It was a big deal. Another one of my favorite shows or episodes was Why Was Bruce Fired by WWE? How much of that story did we not hear? Because I feel like there are yeah. parts of the story that that wasn't shared on the show that you that you probably had personal conversation with Bruce, but I thought that that was probably one of the best episodes that you all have done with something to wrestle with, with Bruce Pritchard. I appreciate you saying so. It's probably five to ten minutes uh, that's not on the show, but you're exactly right. There was a little more, and um, you can use your imagination what it was about, but, yeah, there is there is five to ten minutes more of it, and uh, it's kind of up to Bruce what he wants to share and not share, and he shared more in there than I thought he would because the first time he told me the story, and then when I finally convinced him that we needed to do this, I never imagined we'd get as much as we did. So I'm proud of him for sharing what he decided to share. Hmm. Oh, so he, he actually shared more than you anticipated him sharing on the show. Yeah. I mean, I don't, you know, I know this sounds crazy, but I don't think it's anybody's damn business. You know, if he <laughs> says, Hey, I want to talk about it, then who are we to say, no, you have to, like he doesn't owe us anything. And so I thought it was pretty cool that he was like, you know, okay, I'll talk about it. I, I didn't, I didn't expect that. I'm proud of him. Go ahead, BG. I, go ahead. You finish that, and I'm gonna come back with my. Go ahead. Well, I was gonna ask him if he had, if, 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 if uh, Conrad, if you had a favorite show, you know, or a favorite um, episode that you've done. It's like asking me to pick my kid, I guess, because there's so many of these that I really enjoy. Um, but the Sunny episode was fun. The TNA episode was fun. Uh, I thought the Radicals was probably our breakthrough episode. I think the Jim Cornette one is one of the funniest ones we've ever done. That's a fun uh, one. <laughs> I, had a, I had a great time with the Q and A's just because there's so many rapid fire ones. But as far as a really focused show lately, it's probably the Jim Cornette one. And, and I think a more underrated one is the million dollar man one. I grew up in that era and I think the million dollar man stuff is awesome. Absolutely. Million dollar man and Mr. Perfect were pre- two pretty good shows. Go ahead, BG. I'm sorry. So, I mean, with all that considered, like you've had these, you've talked about, these figures you've been in the room with some of these guys who are active in the heyday of what I would, what I would call the heyday of, um, of wrestling. What, what is your takeaway on how they feel about the way that the, the sport has treated them or what they've gained from the sport? You know, these many years after, are they satisfied with their place in the history or do they feel like they've been shortchanged? What is your kind of your takeaway from your experiences? Well, the wrestling business breeds a lot of paranoia. So every now and again, you'll hear maybe more paranoia than you think is realistic or reasonable from some of these guys. But it, it is it is very much like a drug. You know, I think you get to a point to where uh, it's hard to get rid of it, even though you can, you know, say, hey, you know what? It's time for me to go do something else. It always seemingly kind of pulls you back in. And I think most of what that is is the camaraderie of being with your friends. and. At the end of the day, that's what wrestling is to me. I enjoy it the most when I do it with my friends. And I'm kind of that way with drinking too, though. Like I have alcohol in my house, but if I don't have friends over, I'm not drinking it. Well, I have wrestling on my DVR, but if I don't have friends over, I'm probably not watching it. And I know that's crazy, but I just very closely associate uh, wrestling uh, with, you know, my friends and family. Very similar to maybe sports. I I couldn't imagine wanting to watch an Alabama game without my dad. When I think of watching an Alabama game, I think about watching it with my dad. And the idea that 
you know, I could pick anybody in the world to watch it with, I'd pick my dad. Well, I think a lot of guys do that with their work. And especially when they're on this traveling circus, so to speak, for so long, I really do feel like it's the camaraderie that they miss the most. And it's hard for them to just move on. And if they had a regular traditional job, they would make rational decisions based on how many days am I away? How much money am I making? Where do I have to live? You know, the normal stuff we all think about when we're doing a job. And a lot of times these guys are, but I need to be a part of this. And they just wind up hanging on and making bad decisions and put themselves in a bad place. And it breeds paranoia that sometimes they ultimately blame the business, but they weren't blaming the business when they were having a good time. Where, where, where's the business at now in regards to today? What do the experts or the insiders think about the current storylines and, 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 and the writing today compared to, compared to what it was? Well, you asked two questions there. Where is the business today? It's better than ever. Now, most people would would hear that and say, well, it's not as big as it once was. Compared to what is what I would say. At the end of the day, it is the wrestling business. So when you look at top line gross, they're bringing in more gross revenue right now than ever before. Are they bringing in more net profit? No. They need to work on that, and they are. Uh, But some of that is startup costs, like the network and such. So I do Mm -hmm. believe that globally, Mm -hmm. and that's what we're talking about, is a global product at this point that wrestling is at an all-time high globally. Now, domestically, maybe not so much. And maybe part of that is maybe less people are interested in wrestling now, but the people who are interested in wrestling now are willing to spend more money. And so that gets back to that business part of the equation. I think the wrestling business is very healthy. Um, But I do think that a lot of people make a living now kind of second-guessing the writing and the creative. But I don't understand that all the time. I watch and I really enjoy a show called Better Call Saul, and I watch it every week. But when that show's over, I don't get online and say, hey, Jimmy should have did this. Jimmy should have done that. Here's what kept that from being a perfect perfect episode. Jimmy didn't do this. Instead of looking right, Jimmy should have looked left. And some wrestling (laughs) fans will hear me say that, and they say, well, that's silly. That's stupid. That's saying, I don't understand the business. No, it's not saying that. It's saying it's not your show. It's their show, and that's what they put out. And if you like it, watch it. And if you don't, don't. And and that sounds really simplistic, but sometimes I'll think a a football game is boring. I'll change the channel. Well, if I think wrestling's boring and I'm not into it, I'll change the channel. How have the live shows been? You all have done a few live shows. What have those experiences been like for you? We've actually only done one so far, and we did it in Orlando, WrestleMania weekend. We announced it over Thanksgiving. It was sold out in January, and uh, Mm -hmm. we did it on April 1st. And it was um, a thrill, to say the least. I've never done anything like that before. I didn't know exactly what to expect. I knew people would dig it, not because you know we were arrogant enough to think that we couldn't do any wrong, but just because we knew these people had heard the podcast, they kind of know what to expect. I thought it was a great time. I think everybody had a good time that night. And we're doing another one on June 4th in Baltimore at Jimmy's Seafood right before Extreme Rules. And then we'll do uh, the next one in St. Louis. And that's on Father's Day on June 18th. That's going to be at the South Broadway Athletic Club right before Money in the Bank. And then we've got shows through the rest of the year, whether you're in Detroit, Philadelphia, Houston, uh, New York, wherever you are, we're coming to see you. And the Baltimore show and the St. Louis show are both sold out? Not yet. They both will sell out, though. We're all well on our way. The first show in New York uh, is going to sell out for sure. It's already sold out. It's August 19th. But we're on our way to selling out the second night, uh, which is August 20th, right before SummerSlam. Uh, but somewhere in between there, I think July 23rd, we're going to Philadelphia. That'll be our biggest event yet. We've got more tickets there uh, to sell than anywhere, but it's also one of our biggest markets. And more people have bought tickets to Philadelphia than I ever thought they would. That's that's huge. No, it is. is. It's caught caught us by surprise. We never expected it. You know, we're brother love and the mortgage guy. And we say that half tongue in cheek, but that really is how we feel. We're kind of shocked that so many damn people want to listen every week. So we take it very seriously and we work very hard to try to put out the best show we can possible every week. So when I say, hey, we worked on it for, you know, 12 hours, I'm not saying that like, whoa, whoa, was me. I feel an obligation to do that. So many people are listening. I don't want to put out a turd. I need to put out good content. And how many listeners do you have now? Y'all up in the three, three, four million? Yeah, we're somewhere between three and four million a month right now, um, depending on what the episodes look like and how they fail. 
Uh, but on any given week, it's it's right around a million, somewhere between eight hundred and a million. And and the end game being just wanting to highlight your your mortgage company that it's that's it's amazing. <laughs> it's it's a, a it's a hobby. Hobby. That's a hell of a hobby, man. That is a hell of a. How do you keep it all in, in perspective and keep things balanced? Because you do have like the the traditional job that you also do this alongside of. So how how do you keep everything balanced out? Well, you know, it's easy. It's easier because my girlfriend lives uh, four states away. So she's a seven hour drive for me. So we wind up only seeing each other on the weekends, uh, but we do get to spend most every weekend together. But as a result, I have plenty of free time through the week. So I just load up this stuff. So whenever I'm done working at my real job, I come home and work on my second job, work on my hobby. I like how you started it all with your girlfriend. That's going to go over real well. Thank you. <laughs> that's gonna go over so what? good <laughs> he don't have to spend that time i got it i got you though i got you what days what days do y'all record or, or or how does that work out with with both of y'all schedules uh we usually record uh bruce's on wednesdays or thursdays and we record tony shivani's on sundays just changing the podcast game and that's why i wanted to have him on the show because when you when you see that is and and for him to come up with this format and it's it's a format that I I don't see an end to it because it, there's so much history and so much knowledge there that I just see that they have it, it can continue to go. Well, that's the hope and and the, and the real you know magic is that this format will work with anything. So we're actually in in works right now to do a golf version and a NASCAR version and a college football version and a pro football version. And uh, we've even got a baseball version. And I really do feel like exploring one topic long form with someone who was there and someone else who's willing to put in the work. I I feel like that's a winning, winning option. And uh, I know it will work and it has worked. And so obviously we're going to do lots more spinoffs with the wrestling shows. Uh, but now we're we're kind of taking what we've learned and trying to push it out into these other areas because we know it'll work there as well. Gotcha, gotcha. Been a great show, BG. What you got? I'm just thrown off about the whole – let me not say thrown off. I'm inspired by the fact of how your hobby and a passion project, project can turn into something so so big. You know, and and we, we let me just listen to the story. It wasn't even planned out. It was just about kind of being at the right place at the right time with the right individuals. Um, are you amazed, Conrad, by the fact that the um, that these guys, these these stars, are so willing to talk about their past and their careers and things? Uh, yes and no. I mean, most of them are still in a position where they need to earn a living and earn an income. And I'm not knocking that. I mean, I'm still working too, but I feel like they see the big picture of, uh, Hey, we're building an audience here. And this is an audience that you can offshoot stuff to. Yes. You can you know, sell advertising to, but now we've turned our audience into live shows. We've turned our audience into a group of folks who buy t-shirts We've turned our audience into mortgage refinance customers. And so that all of that stuff is something that when you really lay out the vision for, and I think a lot of people get this backwards, that, that there's this mentality now where it's like, hey, make me the manager and I'll start showing up to work on time. That's not the way it works. You know, you've got to go out there and put the work in first. And if you're willing to do that, then the reward will come. But we had to be willing to do a whole bunch of podcasts for free and no one listening hoping that eventually more people would listen, hoping that eventually somebody would pay us. And we did it long enough that they did. It's not like, hey, give me $10 million and I'll have a big rap album. No, no, no. Go make the big rap album. Then we'll give you $10 million. That's the way it works. And and there's so many people now who aren't willing to put in the work without some sort of guarantee. And there just aren't any guarantees. The guarantee is if you're good, if you're the best, people will figure out a way to come find you and then they'll pay to see you. But if you're just like everybody else or you're not willing to put in the work, then nobody cares. And and, th- and that's kind of one of the things we were able to do early with Bruce is I said, hey, listen, this isn't going to be big right up front. But in a year, this will be the biggest thing going. We just got to hang in there and do it like this. And we had a real plan and we did it. And, and the plan isn't even overthinking. It's just simple psychology. Rather than us guess what people want to listen to, here's an idea. 
let's just ask them, hey, guys, what do you want us to talk about? They make suggestions. We put four of them on a poll. Everybody else votes. Easy enough. Now everybody's doing that in our genre. There's lots of people who are copying that, and I'm not upset about it. They've just realized, hey, there's some real logic here. Yeah, there is. Ask them what they want and then give it to them. So I, I appreciate you saying that you're inspired, but realistically, it's not it's not that difficult to do. You've just got to set a plan in motion of where you want to be and then work backwards. And I wanted as many people as I could to hear about First Family Mortgage. And the way I knew to do that was to create new content for free and push it out there and work really hard to make sure the content's good. The word of mouth will get around. And now instead of having to pay to have a million people listen to hear a commercial for First Family Mortgage, now they pay me and they still listen to the commercial about First Family Mortgage. <laughs> and now you have it. Conrad, I really appreciate you joining us on Free Lunch Podcast. It's been an amazing story. BG, you got any last questions thank before you, we... Thank you, your, thank you for your time, Conrad. No more questions. Just wishing you the, the, the best. Keep pushing all the success in the world with all of your future endeavors. Hey, man, I appreciate you guys. I know you guys have done a bunch of episodes here. I appreciate what you're trying to do. My only advice to you would be a shameless self-promoter. You know, any opportunity I've got to come on and promote my stuff, I want to, whether it's with you guys or anywhere else. If I'm not talking about my business, who else is? Uh, I'm going to talk about it all the time. And you guys are clearly doing good work here to have as many episodes in the bag as you do. And uh, I'm proud of you guys for sticking with it and trying to grow something and make something. And I hope your stuff blows up, man. Absolutely, absolutely. And next time, so I live in Atlanta, in the Atlanta area, actually is in Smyrna, Georgia. And when you're in Atlanta and you're hanging with Rick, we got to hang. I got to have a beer with you. Well, I'll see you Saturday. Are you going <laughs> to be in Atlanta Saturday? I'll be in Atlanta Saturday at the bar with the Nature Boy, Rick Flair. Well, let's have, let let I will text you. I'll email you. And I definitely want to, and I definitely want to meet up. I guarantee you, I'll be there. Guarantee you. Sounds, you sounds good, man. All right. All right. Before before you go, before you go, take advantage of this opportunity to let people know how they can connect with you, the podcast, your company, all that good stuff. Take it. Take this time to plug. If you'd love to refinance or buy a house, or you're not so sure if you've got enough equity in your house, or you're upside down and your credit won't qualify, or you're not sure you can afford to buy a house, I can make it happen. You don't need perfect credit. I'm the home of the second chance refinance. Whether you're looking to pay off credit card debt, add on to your house, put in a swimming pool, or go ahead and buy a house with no money down, you do not need perfect credit or money out of your pocket. OneFMC.com can make it fast and easy. We're not even going to charge you to check your credit. If we can't save you money, we won't waste your time. You're in and out. 10 minutes. 1FMC.com. I'm on Twitter. I'm very active there. I would love to interact with you. Give me a follow at Hey, Hey, It's Conrad. Uh, And of course, you can check out our podcast every Friday at noon, Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. It drops at MLWRadio.com or anywhere you enjoy podcasts from iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, anywhere. And then on Monday, it's What Happened When Monday with Tony Schiavone. That's 6 a.m. just in time for your morning drive. Also at MLWRadio.com. You have it, folks. Conrad Thompson. And you will be hearing from me on Saturday. I look forward to meeting you in person. All right. Look forward to it. Talk soon. You coming out Saturday? Saturday? (laughs) Man, I'm going to be there. You coming? Woo! (laughs) Woo! (laughs) Even though this is a, a wrestling show. Uh, we stressed out a little bit outside of our norm. We still ended up in that place of finding your passion and living in it. We we still found our way around to that thing. I mean, he got the right format. He's he to me, he's a pioneer, and for him to be able to you know come up with this format, which is you know I've me and you offline have spoken about this about this format. We've I've shared with you this format and. And and he has a formula now. He's trying to go into other industries. And I've actually thought about that same thing as far as the, the college football approach. So, I mean, I think he's on to something. Evidently, he turned his hobby into a moneymaker for him man, and a platform to, to further, you know, his, his franchising and his brand. So it, it's working. He's got the blueprint. He does. He does. He does. So That joke is doing numbers too, man. Oh, absolutely. 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 Top, top 10 regularly on iTunes. So, man, I got to be I got to meet the Nature Boy. I have to meet the Nature Boy. <laughs> I'm telling you, I am going to email him 
And if he hit me back, wherever he's at, I'm I'm there. He said he'll see you Saturday. He said he'll see me Saturday. So let's get up out of here. That's up. Let the people know how they can get a get a hold of us. Man, we are the Free Lunch Podcast, a member of the New South Movement Podcast Network. Check for us on iTunes and SoundCloud. Just search New South Movement, New South One Word, where you'll find us and the rest of our podcast members. The Retroscope Podcast, Fearless Mystic Podcast, D1 Sports Talk, got something for everybody. Also, you can find us at NewSouthNet.com. I'm BG, the 27 Kid, BG underscore DA27 KID on Instagram and Twitter. Check for me. And I am your boy, Tight. Instagram, Tight underscore, Tight underscore. Look forward to you all following us. Tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend. The hottest podcast in the in the South, Free Lunch Podcast, a member of the New South Movement Podcast Network, and we are out of here. Peace. Fitness of the world on fire. 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 Fitness of the world on fire.